Does everybody know what time it is? Time to have a critical reading about a sitcom from the 90s. At least I get to talk about it with Jose. Back in the 90s, one of TV's most successful sitcoms was Home Improvement. Debuting on September 17, 1991, Home Improvement was an instant hit with audiences. Although never a critical darling, throughout its eight-season run, it remained one of the top ten most-watched shows on television. In spite of its broad appeal, or perhaps because of it, the show only received a handful of award nominations, including eight primetime Emmys. The series didn't win a single one, though it did win five technical Emmys for lighting. With a grunt and a few explosions, Home Improvement found its way into the hearts of millions of Americans, all tuning in to see what the tool man would do next. But before this show hit it big, it started with one man in particular, a stand-up comic named Tim Allen. Allen began performing stand-up in 1978 after he was dared into it by a friend. He honed his craft over the next decade, including a brief stay in prison where he served just over two years for possession of cocaine. He eventually moved to Los Angeles, where he became a regular at the Comedy Store, and eventually he had a pair of specials on Showtime. He rose to fame using his signature theme of men struggling to cope with the modern world, often with grunting. Primitive grunting baboons, that's what we are. That's how we should talk. Ah, 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 ah. After being scouted by the heads of ABC, Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, Allen was chosen to be the lead for a sitcom pilot. He was teamed with TV producers Carmen Finestra, David McFadzian, and Matt Williams. Williams and McFadzian had recently left the hit sitcom Roseanne, and in spite of past difficulties working with a stand-up, Williams was won over by talking to Tim Allen about their days growing up in the Midwest. Tim Allen's ideas heavily shaped the early concept of the sitcom, under its original title, Hammer Time. This title, for reasons too legit to quit, had to be dropped, so they stopped Hammer Time and went with Home Improvement. Home Improvement is one of those rare sitcoms that seemed to be fully formed from its first episode, although there was a bit more turbulence getting there than you might imagine. It would star Tim Allen as Tim Taylor, the host of a local TV home repair show in Detroit, Michigan. What I'd like to do is make fun of uh, Bob Beale and Norm Abrams, and they said, what? Well, let me outline it. I'd like to do that show because I love makeovers, but I want to be a complete uh, F-up. Tim's wife Jill was originally cast to be Frances Fisher. The producers didn't find her to be a great fit, so she was replaced by Patricia Richardson while filming the pilot. Jill's role is to hold the family together at home, all while trying to make a life for herself that's more than being a homemaker. I'm perfectly happy being married to a man who thinks that PBS is something that women get once a month. <laughs> she and Tim also have the timeless struggle of holding a marriage together. Mark was right. Oh, you shouldn't have double onions on this chili dog. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Brad, played by Zachary Ty Bryan, is their oldest son. Much like his dad, he's into cars and working with his hands, but he's also an athlete. And in earlier seasons, you can see him with this hair crime. Brad also inherited Tim's sharp intellect. And then you're going to go back to the stores, take this stuff back, and get the money for it. And then you're going to go back to the shelter, you're going to take him the money, and you're going to tell them that you stole it. But Mom, they're going to think we're thieves. Good Brad. <laughs> Randy is played by Jonathan Taylor Thomas the wisecracker of the Taylor boys. Randy is more into the arts, and in later seasons, he has a budding social conscience. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> what is it? I can't even figure it out. Well, don't rack your brain. You might smash the pee. Mark, played by Tara Noah Smith, is the youngest, and grows from being a small boy who idolizes his father to being a TV version of a goth. Also, he's kind of into film towards the end. I'm not supposed to be snazzy. <laughs> I was being facetious. I think they're hideous and completely twisted. All right. Living next door to the Taylors is their eccentric neighbor, Wilson Wilson. Although originally played by John Bedford Lloyd, he backed out of the role after learning he would spend the whole series with his face obscured by a fence. He was replaced by Earl Hindman. There was a time when I thought my extensive research into ancient tribal cultures, obscure scientific data, the thoughts of great philosophers would never come in handy. Then you moved in. 
On the set of Tool Time, Tim was joined by Al Borland, played by Richard Carn. Originally a completely different character named Glenn, the actor slated to play Tim Taylor's sidekick, Stephen Tobolowski, was booked on a movie and couldn't make time to appear on the pilot. The character of Al was only supposed to be temporary, a one-off character in the pilot, but Alan liked him so much that Karn became a regular on the series, replacing Tobolowski. Al is the competent, sensitive, and kind yin to Tim's incompetent, manic, and abrasive yang. He's also a bit of a softy. You know, I, I, I wouldn't want to be too forward, but I, I would love to be the father of your children. <laughs> That's one hell of a first date line. Al's a bit clingy when it comes to women. The final character was Tool Time's Tool Girl, Lisa, originally to be played by Ashley Judd. She was initially a modern girl who would be a foil to Tim's old-fashioned ideas, but when Judd backed out of the series for a movie career instead, the role of Lisa was dramatically reduced, and it was given to first-time actress Pamela Anderson. With the cast assembled, the show was ready to debut, tackling how masculinity would define itself in the 90s. It's not the most original premise, but hey, this version has grunting. Ah! The series opens with an introduction to the show within a show, as we see Tim watching himself on Tool Time. You know, men, we want a job done right, and we want it done quick. What do we need? More power! Darn right, more power. We're quickly introduced to our first crisis. Stay-at-home mother Jill has a job interview. Tim, this job is important to me. Aren't you excited about me going back to work? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Could you maybe work up a little enthusiasm? I'm sorry, honey. Gosh, I'm excited that you won't be laying around the house mooching off the boys and me. The introduction to Wilson establishes his role as the sage neighbor who offers Tim advice, most often through the lens of a male-centric reading of history. The reason you're having problems with your wife is because you don't know who you are as a man. I don't have a problem in that area, Wilson. <laughs> Not what I mean, Tim. A lot of men feel lost, confused. You see, Tim, the Industrial Revolution took the adult male out of the home. Boys were left without an older man to teach them how to be men. We need to get back to something more primitive. You don't need testosterone to be a handyman, but what this show does so well is show us how mythology can be selectively read to reinforce certain worldviews. Wilson's job is to cherry-pick parts of history to fit that masculine stereotype. Although his ideology and personality are often inconsistent, sometimes Wilson will have a really good take. But other times, like this episode, not so much. You see, Tim, it's time for men to reclaim the male spirit. The idea of an inherent maleness that's being trampled on by a modern society is at the heart of home improvement, its early seasons in particular. You don't have to feel bad. Don't which... tell me how to feel. I'm just saying if it were me, what it's I would... It's not you, Tim, it's me. What I mean is you don't have to work. You don't really want me to work. No, 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 no. I make enough money for both of us. No, this is not about money. This is, this is about me having a life outside of this house. My, my autonomy. Your autonomy? Yeah. How do you spell that? Don't start. Don't start. While Tim is presented as the prototypical man, a constant through history confronted by this strange new reality, He's really just an American man whose attitudes are a few decades out of date. He's bound to a very specific time and culture. When Tim grunts, he's signaling that his masculinity is imbued into our DNA, something primal, something primitive. The grunting is actually a facade, and that facade will be challenged throughout this series. And it's worth noting as the series goes along, Tim grunts less and less. I just, I can't tell you how impressed I am by the emotional depth that I've seen in you like Oh, you know, I've always had this sneaky yet slightly disturbing suspicion that there actually might be something to me. <laughs> oh, come on. Bring me back my old Tim. Mm -hmm. Grunt for me. <laughs> Give it a shot. <sighs> <laughs> Argra, Argra, I don't do this. It's not happening, honey. Mmm. Oh, yeah. The reaction of critics to the first episode wasn't particularly favorable, as Tim Allen himself would note a decade later. Critics didn't really like this show that much. 
As a matter of fact, I mean, there's a bunch of critics said, you, you know, it just won't last. There was one newspaper, I'm not going to mention the New York Times by name, but they, um, <laughs> wow, that was, that was really weird. I mean, that just slipped out. I'm sorry. They said the show couldn't go three episodes. I mean, how many things can this meathead blow up? But the show was an instant hit with viewers and would be popular with TV audiences throughout its entire run. The idea of women living independently from men comes up a lot in the early seasons, and since Tim is our focal point for this series, this is presented as a threat to his traditional role as the grunting patriarch. In the first season episode, Forever Young, Young spelt J-U-N-G, we meet Jill's friend Karen, played by Betsy Randall, who knows just how to get under Tim's skin. Oh, well, Tim, I mean, it, it is a, a very big, powerful tool. I see. You think I've got to have this just to prove my manhood? You said it. I, I didn't say that. There's one question in particular that makes him squirm, though. We're a 90s couple. We share everything 50-50 right down the middle. Come sit okay, down. okay. Let me give you a little test. Jill gets a high-paying executive position. Ooh, I like this test already. Do I get to have a male secretary? You got him. Can't type, but he looks really cute in jeans. Perfect. Okay, so Tim, should she take this job? If he's gay. <laughs> Absolutely. The job's in Seattle. It's, it's, so it's fine. It's fine. Well, maybe Jill doesn't want to uproot the kids. No, no, no. The kids love the idea. Do we move, Tim? Karen, this is stupid. Okay, okay. Let me ask you another question. Tool time goes national, but you have to move to New York. Do you go? Yeah, it's my job. It'd be perfect. If it's okay with Jill. Oh, so you're saying that uh, your job is more important than hers? She didn't have a job. Answer the question, Tim. Do you move to New York or Seattle? I think a lot depends on where you'll be living. <laughs> Unlike most encounters with Wilson, where Tim struggles to understand tough concepts, he gets this episode's theme right away. Well, Tim, that's just the burden you bear for living in a patriarchal society. Yeah, patriarchal. Dominated by men. <laughs> well, I don't know, Tim. Maybe one day men and women will learn to share the power to cooperate rather than dominate. Wilson's take here is surprisingly good, and one that leads to a decent conclusion for the episode, as Brad is heading out to his first dance, and Tim offers some fatherly advice. Yeah, but what if I lead with the wrong foot or step on her toes? Dancing's not about who's leading. Mom says the man always leads. Well, when men and women are dancing correctly, no one's leading. You just move with the music. You, you don't know how you get there, but you just get there. There's no easy solution for how men and women will live together, but it ends with Brad going on his first date, where his gruffer masculine side is made tamer by his attraction to Jennifer. Brad, get on down here, will you? <laughs> Father? The idea here is that men and women can bring out the best in each other, so it's better that we work together instead of one side dominating the other like dancing together and not pretending we know who leads. The show doesn't pretend it'll be easy, but part of an ongoing process. There's still problems of men and women reduced to their static, essential characteristics, but offering an opportunity of growth is where the show offers a glimpse of promise. Older viewers might be thinking, even for the 90s, this isn't exactly cutting edge. We saw vestiges of old masculinity being challenged as far back as All in the Family. I'm sure we can all point to shows doing the exact same thing airing right now. That's because this discussion about how men and women can share power isn't something that's gone away. And it won't go away until we figure it out. It's one of the few parts of home improvement that still has some relevance and can still speak to what's happening today. Because in spite of all the progress we've made, misogyny is still a thing. And we're still trying to build a world where men and women can actually be seen as equal. But even in episodes where it felt like Tim's character was making some kind of progress, some of them were like the season 3 episode, What You See Is What You Get, where he starts so far back that he comes off as a complete jerk. You know, I've been researching that article on plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. I just interviewed a woman who bought herself a whole new body because her husband left her for a younger woman. They were married 12 years, had four kids. She made a big mistake. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. Had she had this surgery some time ago, she could have saved the marriage. 
Tim has another bad reaction when he sees Jill messing around with a computerized version of herself that would show what she looks like should she have plastic surgery. Wow. What? Wow. <laughs> Are you saying you think I'd look good like that? <laughs> And he keeps digging himself deeper. Jill, you gotta see this. Now I know why they call it the boob tube. Look at this. The resolution for this episode is Tim acknowledging that he would like to be with his wife no matter how old she gets. It's simple, bland, and uninteresting. Tim's personality seems harsher overall in this episode, but maybe it's because I went into this episode knowing it was the only one in the entire series where Tim Allen had a writing credit. It makes me think that if Tim Allen had had a stronger influence on the scripts earlier on, perhaps writing them himself, he may not have come off so likable. We need to take a slight detour from our discussion about the early seasons to talk about the big change in the show between seasons 2 and 3, and that's the passing of the Tool Girl Tool Belt. Not satisfied with her role on the show, which usually involved a thought-provoking line about temporality. Does everybody know what time it is? Pamela Anderson left Home Improvement after the second season in pursuit of a more challenging acting role on Baywatch. The show gave her an increase in lines and plot threads, along with an even bigger increase in time spent running in slow motion. Anderson would be replaced by Debbie Dunning in the first episode of season three, our new tool girl would be named Heidi. This wasn't Dunning's first appearance on the show though, as she played a completely different character in the episode Overactive Glance in the second season. In that episode, her name was, uh, uh... Kiki Von Furstenwall and Shinelaw. <laughs> yeah, that. Dunning would have a larger role than Anderson as the series progressed, having a handful of plot lines dedicated to her character and more lines throughout the episodes. And we also got a neat little Tool Girl crossover in Season 6 when Pamela Anderson came back for an episode. I think Pamela Anderson had more lines in this episode than the entirety of the first two seasons. In the seventh season, Dunning would finally get her name in the opening credits of the series, but her role was never as expensive as any of the other regular characters on the series. All that being said, she does a good job with what she's given, and if they were looking to replace one gorgeous woman with another, they definitely succeeded. Back to the early seasons. A major concern for the early seasons is how Tim struggles with raising his three sons. There are a number of episodes that deal with this, though one of the more notable ones is Rights and Wrongs of Passage, in which Brad enters a rebellious phase. You are beyond grounded. No TV, no seeing your friends, no talking on the phone. And no oh, monster man. truck rally. That's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? I stick up for you so you can go. What do you end up doing coming on with a cop? I'm going to the truck rally. You're going to bed. You can't tell me what to do. Yes, I can tell you what to do. That's my job. Now go on upstairs. You can forget about those Fordzilla tickets. I'm giving them to somebody else. Can I bring Billy? Oh, shut up! <laughs> Wilson gives us one of his not-so-good takes to explain it. But unfortunately, in our industrial society, we don't have these rituals. We prolong adolescence beyond the biological indications of manhood, confusing the child as well as the parent. The idea of a teenager acting out being a product of the 19th century would be news to anyone who's read or seen Romeo and Juliet. So I don't really buy his explanation as to why we're getting a Breaking Brad episode. You like That's a pretty good pun, right? Breaking Brad? No? No. Tim's eventual solution is to give Brad a taste of manhood. Or at least manhood as Tim defines it. What are you trying to do? I'm getting the tailpipe set up for the exhaust system. Oh. I could do it. No, this is man stuff. You gotta do all the torching and flame and... Why don't you give it a shot? We see another example of the importance of masculine coding in growing up in Bell Bottom Blues, where Brad gets in trouble for fighting another kid. You're grounded three days, you know that. That's not fair. Why did you hit this boy? Because he was making fun of me. That's not a reason to punch anybody. Why are you angry at me? It's your fault. Beep, beep, back the truck up. <laughs> Why is it my fault? This morning when you dropped me off at school, you hugged me in front of all my friends. Once again, Wilson gives us a bad take. It's a funny thing, you know, he doesn't want me to touch him, but he'll still wrestle and roughhouse with me. Well, that's because throughout history, men have been more comfortable expressing affection through combative gestures. 
Men have shared affectionate gestures like hugging and holding hands in plenty of cultures, but in this episode, Wilson is cherry picking from history. Not that Wilson is entirely wrong with his examples of handshakes and salutes, but the point is Wilson is only sharing one side of the story that holds up a specific vision of manhood. The resolution of the Brad plot has Tim agreeing not to hug him anymore. Remember, I'm your father. I'm not a man. <laughs> right, Dad. Anyway, I promise I won't hug in front of your buddies anymore. Okay. But I'm still going to say I love you. Oh, Dad, that's ten times worse than hugging. It seems absurd to bow to this social pressure. There's nothing wrong with a father hugging his son, especially a son who's still in grade school. But what can be read here instead is how Tim's parenting can't escape the demands of a society that has certain expectations of men, even when Tim himself thinks they're silly. So it's not that Tim is a bad father, but rather a victim of the intense pressure put on boys to behave within a certain masculine ideal. And that ideal, in this case, would be not to express affection physically. A less conventional father-son dynamic is Tim's relationship with Randy. Seen in To Build or Not To Build, Randy doesn't take to the workshop projects his brothers do when they're making Mother's Day gifts for Jill. Look, Dad, I'll just buy Mom something. No, I don't buy her something. I don't like doing this stuff. Yeah, you like it. Dad, I didn't want to do this in the first place. Well, why not just finish it for you? Great. <laughs> And tellingly, the episode scene with Wilson doesn't have him doling out classical wisdom on what it means to be a man. This is a new problem, something that the traditional masculinity that Wilson espouses, which is really just a masculine cliché, can't really cope with. Instead, we see Wilson and his mother exchange a few lines about the importance of a gift's spirit. After all, it was Pierre Corneille, the noted French playwright, who wrote, I am in the habit of looking not so much to the nature of the gift, as to the spirit in which it is given. Oh, that's beautiful, yeah. Excuse me, son, are you sure it was Corneille? I believe it was Robert Louis Stevenson. Well, by golly, Mom, I think you're right. <laughs> Pierre Corneille wrote, the manner of giving is worth more than the gift. It shows us an example of perhaps a more useful reading of history and ancient wisdom by dispensing with the gender coding and instead getting to the heart of a message. While Brad's path to manhood is more conventional, Randy shows us that there's more than one way to make a man, and that the idea of manhood is more expansive than the narrow vision of Wilson's definitions, filled with essentialist commentary on what a man is. The passage from boyhood to manhood is one that creates a lot of frustration and anxiety, and growing up it's only natural for a boy to have questions on what it means to become a man. What makes the old story shared by Wilson and modern masculinity represented in Tim so appealing is that it reduces the confusion of figuring out what it means to be a man. There's something comforting about a whole set of behaviors and customs designed for men to inherit when they come of age. It takes a lot of the difficulty out of growing up when someone has a path charted out for you. But what if you're like Randy and you don't fit into that mold? How do you find your way towards manhood? It seems that the definition of what it means to be a man needs to expand to include more types of people. In the context of home improvement, that means allowing manhood to expand beyond sports and power tools to include magic tricks and performing in school plays. This is still a show from the 90s though, and it can only get us so far. It's broadening the definition of what it means to be a man, but it's still very much only representing the cis, white, hetero perspective. Non-white men are never a part of the principal cast, and neither are gay men. The closest glimpse we even get of trans men are some less than enlightened jokes. So what's more important than the show's banal message of saying that it's okay for a boy to want to perform magic tricks is the deeper meaning behind it. Rather than exclude people who don't fit the typical definition of manhood, it's better to expand that definition and celebrate the differences we see around us. Now let's talk about getting hit in the dick. Another big part of this series is Tim getting hurt. A lot. Pretty much every episode of Home Improvement includes a scene where some home repair project goes wrong and Tim usually gets hurt. Nothing ever too serious, but, you know, we see that he feels pain. In the series' first clip show, a two-parter titled Tool Time After Dark, there were no clips shown of the Taylor family drama. Instead, we saw a bunch of random Tool Time episodes featuring Tim getting hurt in a variety of stunts. The slapstick elements of humor for this series are very much baked into its DNA, which makes complete sense because slapstick is a type of humor particularly suited to men talk humor theory for a moment. The reason slapstick works is because it takes the violation of a norm, in this case a person suffering physical harm and or being embarrassed, and presents it in a way that's benign. 
This is known as the benign violation theory. And the reason it's benign is because it's happening to a man. The assumption here is that men are big and strong so they can handle the punishment and pain of something going awry, whereas women are fragile and need to be protected. While home improvement may question what it means to be a man in the 90s, it never backs away from the idea that there is an archetype of what a man is, and that includes being big and strong, or at the very least, bigger and stronger than women. That's why whenever things go wrong on tool time, the victim is usually Tim, occasionally Al, and once in a while a male guest star. At no point are Lisa or Heidi ever in danger, much in the way Jill is rarely in danger either, because slapstick is about upholding certain gender roles. When you think slapstick, you'll think of something like the Three Stooges or Charlie Chaplin. Typically, it's a man. There aren't many women who engage in slapstick comedy, partially from the assumption that it's not funny when it happens to women because women are more likely to get hurt. In the early seasons, one of the through lines in each episode was Tim building his hot rod in the garage. The significance behind the hot rod is summed up nicely in this scene in the season two episode, Where There's a Will, There's a Way. That was a car that uh, uh, Dad and my brothers, we used to goof around with on Saturdays. And God, it was, it was a hard top convertible. Those were tough to get, you can't find them. Boy, that was a great car. You know, and then, you know, he died. Uncle Harry took the car and he sold it. We never seen it again. And that was the, the, the best thing I ever remember about my dad. Season four capitalizes on the setup of these earlier episodes to hit the father theme particularly hard, specifically the search for an absent father. In He Ain't Heavy, He's Just Irresponsible, we meet one of Tim's brothers, Marty, played by William O'Leary. A new father, Marty is considering running away from his struggling marriage and newborn twin daughters. But then it gets really fun. They walk, they talk. You can roughhouse with them, go to go tractor pulls, teach them how to be guys like us. Tim, they're girls. <laughs> Are they? He eventually decides not to abandon his family. We hit the father theme again in My Dinner with Wilson, where Wilson, who's thinking of moving to Ecuador, would be leaving Tim without a father figure. It's not going to be the same around here without him. I know. He's always been like a father to me. I look up to him. I just can't believe how close we've gotten. Of course, Wilson decides to stay. Really? <laughs> really? So you're not gonna move to Bobo, Brazil? <laughs> no, no, I think I'm gonna stay right here. All right. In Ye Old Shop Teacher, Tim's high school shop teacher comes to visit, and Tim has to deal with seeing one of his adoptive father figures becoming older. And Jill's rarely seen father visits at Christmas in Twas the Night Before Chaos, where she has to learn how to connect with him. And this was all in the first half of the season. That's why this is the daddy season to me, because so much of it was trapped in this search for a positive father figure. And that's outside the usual father-son dynamic between Tim and his sons. The hot rod, symbolizing Tim's relationship with his dad, is the subject of Brother, Can You Spare a Hot Rod, in which Tim decides to sell the hot rod to pizza entrepreneur Doug O'Brien, played by Bruce McGill, whose pizza chain, by the way, is named Papa Mia. Although Tim is just fine selling his beloved hot rod, the family, and Brad in particular, don't take it well. Dad, I, I can't believe you actually did this. If you're going to sell it, you could have at least told me. I hoped you build that. I know, I wasn't planning on selling it. I, I thought you and I were going to go cruising in it and, and showing off for people. Next time you need help, don't bother asking me. Considering how Tim felt about his uncle selling his dad's hot rod, maybe he should have seen this coming. When Tim and Brad go to O'Brien to try and get the hot rod back, we find out what that car meant to him. Unsurprisingly, it involves his father. Daddy sold his car so I could buy my first pizza oven. Wow. And now, you're Papa Mia, the pizza guy. <laughs> when I was on tool time, Daddy saw the car and reminded him of the one he gave up for me. Next month is Daddy's 75th birthday, and I can't think of a thing in the world it would make that wonderful old man any happier than this car. Tim and Brad find an old 46 Ford convertible that becomes a new project for the father and son. It reframes the relationship, moving it from the finished product of a car and instead highlighting what matters most, the time they spent building it together. 
The search for a father is more than just the presence of a man in one's life, but rather the experiences that a positive father figure brings with it. Much of home improvement assumes that manhood and fatherhood are linked, not insofar that one's genes must be passed down, but instead being a positive father figure in the life of a young boy, guiding them to manhood. Search for a father figure prevalent in this season shows that this isn't strictly a challenge for children, but rather something men need throughout their lives, a connection to these moments in their past, and new mentors and guides for the ones still to come. It's also a role not to be shirked off or ignored. It carries with it a pretty heavy burden. And I appreciate the idea that fathers and sons can come in many forms. Speaking of father figures, let's talk about the series regular who is like a father figure, Wilson Wilson. What's up with this guy? We've already looked at how inconsistent his advice is, but aside from his role as wisdom giver in this series, who is he as a character? In the season one episode, Birds of a Feather Flock to Taylor, Tim and Jill are having some marital strife, and then after having made up, hang out in a small bar and dance. Here's the weird thing about this scene. Wilson isn't in it until this part right here. The rest of the time, you only see this mysterious guy in the background reading a newspaper. He has no lines, and the only other time we see this bar in the episode, Wilson isn't in it. So it's not like this is his regular haunt. The only answer here is that Wilson is stalking the Taylor family. How else can we explain Wilson suddenly showing up in the wilderness to offer Tim some advice when the family goes camping in the middle of winter? Or how does Wilson show up in the hospital later on when, again, Tim needs some advice and Wilson is there delivering a baby as a midwife? In the season 3 episode, Twas the Blight Before Christmas, we see Wilson once again stalking the Taylors, this time at church. He doesn't have any lines in this scene. None of the other characters acknowledge him, and this time the camera doesn't even settle on him. Watching this show as a kid, I never noticed he was there. But he was. He was there. Imagine living next to this guy. Sure, there's a 50-50 chance he'll hit you with some wisdom, but the rest of the time I'll have this weird, essentialist, male-centric reading of history. In the season 4 episode, Wilson's Girlfriend, Wilson finally has the chance to be more than an eccentric neighbor and to get some love on the regular. Jill introduces him to her professor. Well, nice to meet you. You too. Jill has told me so much about you. It's all been great. Well, I am flattered. The only thing she didn't tell me was your last name. It's Wilson. Oh, I thought that was your first name. Wilson is my first name. <laughs> we soon learn that Wilson, for all his sagacity, can't seem to share his feelings. He's more into ideas. Oh, my, 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 I must be displaying the symptomatic behavior of the classic male emotional distancer precipitating her to overfunction in the relationship, <laughs> therefore causing deep-seated resentment. <clears throat> so knock it off. Tim, I don't take easily to personal or emotional revelation. No guy does. Opening up emotion is just a horrible thing women make us do. What we're seeing here is the patriarchal standard bearer acknowledging that having a whole other side of humanity introduced to him, in this case from a woman, makes him a more complete being. Wilson is effectively removing the mask of masculinity, represented by this little bit of imagery. And I really like this scene because it gets to the heart of Wilson as a character. Well, my family never really talked much about personal matters. Especially my father, Wilson Wilson Sr. <laughs> what was he like? He was a scientist who didn't put too much stock in emotions. Must have been very difficult to grow up with a man like that. Mm, it was. You know, I love my father. And it always hurt me when he kept me at a distance. And the last thing I ever wanted was to be like him. The primitive man believed that the air he breathed had magic powers. I'm not bored. And when a man and a woman kissed, it was as if their souls were mingling. Wilson's job on this show is to dispense wisdom, all while keeping the lower half of his face hidden. Wisdom, particularly related to feelings, is often the subject of what he says, but he never reveals anything of his inner self. While Wilson knows the value of both, he struggles to escape the conditioning of his childhood. Wilson's covered mouth is a metaphor. The covered mouth is a gate, carefully letting the wisdom out and keeping the feelings inside. When he welcomes with a kiss, he's welcoming her into that space. This would have been a great moment to let everyone see Wilson's face, but sadly the gag would never be dropped, and poor Oral Hinman, who does a fantastic job as Wilson by the way, has to continue standing behind it. 
They even make him hold a stupid little mini fence when he has to do his curtain call at the end of each episode. One lovely bit of subtext in this episode is that Professor manages to be both rich in ideas and emotional expression, whereas she's learned how to adopt traits that are traditionally coded as masculine and become a more complete person, Wilson is a victim of a society that has a rigid view of how men are supposed to behave. While yes, the series is still trapped in the narrow gender binary, it at least acknowledges the profound impact society can have on how those binaries are expressed, almost as if they're on a spectrum or something, and that little line separating them is arbitrary. Wilson may be a bit of a creeper, but he has the capacity to grow. Here he is in the season 6 episode, Burn in Love, with a frightening revelation. We were in fourth grade, I guess we were about nine years of age, and we were inseparable until one day at the playground we had a big fight. About what? Well, I was a big believer in laissez-faire capitalism and she was a neo-Marxist. <laughs> Although this isn't confirmed in the show, I like to think, much like learning to share his feelings, Wilson grew out of believing in silly ideas like laissez-faire capitalism. Oh, 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 oh. I don't have all that much to say about the fifth season. One small thing is how Tim grew as a character, best exemplified in this scene from the episode When Harry Kept Dolores. You're evolving. No, I'm not, and you take that back. <laughs> it's true, you are. No, 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 you're just saying that because you want to believe that you married a deep guy. No, I don't. Yes. Can't you see you're just trying to prove that you married somebody different than your father, honey? Wow. <laughs> what? was an even more profound insight than the one that you had about Harry. I can't stop myself. What's happening to me? You're becoming insightful. Oh, no. But really, this was a season of one episode, and one that'll give me time to talk about another major player in the series, the middle child, Randy, played by Jonathan Taylor Thomas. If you were a girl in the 90s, it's pretty likely you had a crush on this boy. He was on the cover of everything from Tiger Beat to Bop, typically with the affectionate acronym JTT. He really looked like he would be the breakout star of Home Improvement, and for a while, he absolutely was. He was on talk shows, he was at WrestleMania, but he's perhaps best known for playing Young Simba in The Lion King, one of several movies he starred in. Oh, sorry, I've never been a lion cub before. Well, I have. <laughs> you know... I gotta tell you, it's a tough gig. Everyone expects you to be king. Playing the wisecracking Randy, Thomas had the chance to show off his great comedic timing, but as the seasons wore on, it became apparent that he had a lot of range for an actor so young, and so he increasingly got larger roles when it came to any drama surrounding the Taylor Boys. But it was the season 5 episode, The Longest Day, that really showed what he could do. This is one of those classic, very special episodes sitcoms love to do when tackling heavier subjects. In this one, a doctor's visit has revealed a mysterious lump on Randy's throat that may be cancerous. Tim and Jill try to keep it secret from him, but he finds out. I can't believe you guys treat me so good. You know, if I didn't know better, I think I was dying. <laughs> that was a joke, guys. <laughs> It was a joke. I, I didn't get it at first, but I just got it. I got it. Tell your mom. Make sure she got it. What's going on? Does this have anything to do with that blood test I took yesterday? Okay, uh, yeah. But, but there's nothing for you to worry about. Uh, do you remember when the doctor was feeling your neck yesterday? Yeah. Well, um, she felt some swelling. As they wait for test results from the doctor to come in, Jill and Tim find out Randy went missing after school, leading to... What are you doing here? Looking for you. Mom and I are worried about you. You know better than to take off without telling us where you're going. No more even. What do you mean? A couple little things you didn't tell me either, Dad. What are you talking about? Look, I might have cancer. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where did you get that information? Off the computer at school. Said that... Sometimes these kind of lumps can be malignant. Randy, look, the, the chances of this lump being malignant are next to nothing. How could you not tell me about this? Because I didn't want you freaking out, okay? 
Oh, so instead I read about it on a computer sitting in the school library all by myself. Hey, I, I, your mom and I, that's the last thing we wanted you to do. I'm really sorry about that, and she will be too, okay? Why does this bad stuff always have to happen to me? Well, bad stuff happens to everybody. Bad stuff happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, but you cause it. <laughs> I know you're scared, you know? I know how you feel. No, you don't. I don't want to die, Dad. Oh, come on, man. You're not going to die? Even if you had cancer, which you don't, you do not have that. It's a treatable kind, okay? Huh? Huh? Hey, come on, come on. We'll beat this thing, no matter what it is, you know? I'm not letting anything happen to you. This scene ends with Tim promising something he can't possibly deliver, and in many ways Randy feels like he's left fate and medicine to decide what happens next. This being a very special episode on a sitcom, things end up working out by the end and we find out Randy doesn't have cancer but instead a thyroid condition that can be treated with a daily pill. The episode is pretty standard stuff, albeit with some questionable parenting from the Taylors keeping important medical information from their son. It's most remembered, at least by me, for Thomas's performance, one that would make me assume he had a bright future in the acting world ahead of him. The reason we don't talk about Jonathan Taylor Thomas much these days is because in the early 2000s, he stepped away from the world of Hollywood. It wasn't the first time he chose to leave the spotlight though, as will be seen in a later season. We saw some growth in these seasons as the boys start dealing with more adult problems like getting a part-time job or learning how to drive. The show gradually shifts away from telling stories about becoming men and more about becoming adults, albeit with some masculine coding thrown in here and there. What's more interesting though is when Tim runs into examples of his old-fashioned manly advice getting out of hand and he effectively has to deprogram it out of his sons. In the season 6 episode, The Feminine Mistake, we find out Brad's girlfriend is waiting on him hand and foot. Mom, is this going to be another one of your feminist lectures? Brad, women have worked really hard to achieve equality. I know, and the right to make their own choices. Right, exactly. Yeah, well Angela's choice is to do my laundry. And it's anti-feminist of you to judge her for that. And then we get hit with some bio-truths. I can't help how I am. Men have a chromosome you women don't have. The Y chromosome. As in, why do I have to talk about the relationship? One of the core concepts of the show is the confrontation between two ideas. That men have biological urges that are tamed by society, and that the definition of a man should be broader than this supposed biological truth. The wisdom from Wilson in this one reveals that Wilson is apparently a feminist. Oh, men. <laughs> no matter how much ground we feminists have gained, there is still so much work left to be done. We feminists. Oh, Jill, I've always been a big proponent of the women's movement. You know, I spent most of the 60s with my face behind a protest sign. <laughs> Wilson being a feminist is played for laughs, tellingly, because it's not something people would think about him. Even if we'd grant Wilson his feminism stripes, he's talking about the movement from the 60s and doesn't have much to say about feminism in the 90s, which is a completely different wave. Things go worse with Brad. When the girl does all the work, it's not a good relationship. Yeah, you're just saying this because you ended up marrying somebody like Mom. Excuse me? Well, don't get me wrong, I love Mom. You didn't end up with Mom. I love her. I love her because she's a strong woman. You like that she gives you a hard time? Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes it exciting. I keep trying to think of new ways to slip to fire. <laughs> and she's always coming up new ways to nail me. We're equal partners. Brad has to be yanked away from classic masculinity by Tim, a change from Tim who would typically try to reinforce it. This episode is very much about how modern men understand feminism and can use it to correct behavior that exploits women. So now you're a feminist too? I don't know what I am. He's still acting as a feminist here. I'm going to use a term that I've been trying to avoid until now, but I hope those of you in the audience who are resistant to it are ready. This is an example of the danger of toxic masculinity, and how men can be the best champions to protect the next generation from falling prey to it. That's why traditional gender roles and norms need to be challenged. 
And when someone argues to lock those norms into place and not let people violate them, they're also arguing to retain this same toxicity. The point is to hold on to the good and discard the bad, and that can only be done by challenging what it means to be a man. A couple of decades earlier, Brad's behavior would have seemed far less egregious, but by questioning that norm, Angela is given the opportunity to be more than a sandwich dispenser, and Brad is given the opportunity to not be a piece of trash. Women can't be solely responsible for demanding respect from problematic men. Men have to police each other too, particularly fathers raising sons. Although Tim doesn't become entirely enlightened himself, he does seem to understand that his attitudes towards women shapes the way his sons see them as well. So it's not that Brad was defaulting to treating women like a servant because of some biological programming. It was that he was raised to see women that way based on the behavior of his father, and more broadly, the way women are seen in society. In response to losing the boys to adulthood, Tim expresses wanting another child in Say Goodnight, Gracie, after spending the day watching his niece, Gracie. We have ourselves a spot of tea. It's very hot, now don't burn yourself. After our tea, maybe we'll take the corgis out for a walk and a wee-wee. I started thinking about what we miss by not having a daughter. Tim, having spent much of his life raising boys, is ready for a change, and what I like about this episode is how caring for a girl allows him to broaden his perspective. Tim felt like he had to be masculine for his boys, creating a feedback loop. He emphasized his masculinity for their sake, and his presumption of their need for a masculine figure made him dig deeper into that persona. A daughter offers him the chance to access traits he would typically consider feminine, letting Tim explore more of himself and who he can be. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, Dad, uh, so tell us, how many more shows are you planning on doing about dolls? Oh, two. <laughs> Doll patio furniture and the best of Hot Rod Barbie, huh? <laughs> this isn't to say that Tim wasn't always into masculine things before having boys, but rather having to raise boys into men, he accessed that part of himself more frequently, creating a cycle of behavior, where that behavior was continuously reinforced. Also, this episode is a funny joke about Buzz Lightyear, and it was around this time that Tim Allen played the character in the recently released Toy Story movie. I am Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> some more behind the scene notes for season six and seven was some controversy over Tim Allen being arrested for a DUI. By controversy, I mean that audiences reacted to this news by continuing to watch the show. Alan going to rehab at the end of season 7 similarly didn't seem to turn many people away. It's strange how controversy just seemed to slide off Alan's back. I have yet to speak at length about one of the most important characters in the show, Jill Taylor, so let's write that wrong with a brief look at the small arc she went through in the show's 7th season. In Room at the Top, we get our first real example of serious marital strife between Jill and Tim. They fought constantly throughout the series, but this one got especially ugly with the couple fighting in front of their friends and Tim ending up sleeping on the couch. But things got much more fraught a few episodes later in Jill's Passion, where she's tempted at the gym by a man named Ian, played by Tom Wapat. Do you like Lava Wim? Oh, I love Lava Wim. It is coming to town next week. If you'd like to see it, I'd love to take it. Jill turns him down, and there's no real harm done, but Jill catches herself having a dream about Ian later on, which makes her think there's something wrong with her marriage. What was nice about this episode was the resolution. You know, when we first got married, I was so scared that it wasn't going to work out. And then there was this one moment, about six months in, when I realized that we were going to be okay. I remember that. We went on vacation down the islands, walk on the beach, the moon was up there. I told you I loved you more than most of my tools. <laughs> Actually, I blocked that moment out. <laughs> no, I had been really sick. This terrible, terrible flu. And you passed up Laker tickets so that you could stay home and take care of me. Yeah. Well, I was young and in love. <laughs> Big Climax is Tim and Jill taking the time to talk to one another throughout the night and reconnecting on a deeper level. About 10 episodes later though, Ian makes a return in Taking Jill for Granite, where we find out Tim's hired Ian to work on the Taylor family's kitchen, specifically their granite countertops. You know, when I got to your place this morning and you know we saw each other again, 
I, I was afraid it was going to be just awfully uncomfortable all day long. But it wasn't. Not at all. No, it really wasn't. You know, we had a nice talk and a nice lunch and... Mm -mm. <laughs> Tim's reaction is a bit mixed when he finds out his highly sought after granite guy might be a bad dude. Can you imagine what this will look like tomorrow? Pretty much the same. <laughs> Why do you say something like that? I fired in. <laughs> <laughs> For a moment there, I thought you said you fired my granite guy. I did. When I gave him a lift home, he came on to me. You fired the granite guy? Did you hear what I said? He came on to me. What did he say? He had a nice outfit or something? He kissed me. <laughs> what, what did you do? I, I pushed him away. Well, you should have fired him. I did fire him. You fired the granite guy? Tim and Jill patch things up, of course, because as the earlier episodes helped establish, they have a strong marriage. We even get a cute little gag for the closing credits. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I, uh... Yeah. <laughs> I, uh... I, uh... I, uh... I, uh... Oh, oh, oh. But have you spotted the problem with my discussion about Jill? Let's move on to From Top to Bottom, an episode where Jill is invited to be on a TV show panel to discuss what it's like to be a mother and a grad student at the same time. Well, he comes up with all kinds of crazy ideas, like he wanted to buy and move up to a, a hunting lodge. With the kids? The whole family? Yeah, the whole family. Oh, oh, and he wanted to fly into outer space. Oh, now that <laughs> is crazy. Oh, 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 in the middle of, of writing my master's thesis, he decided he wanted to have another baby. <gasps> At your age? Uh, Tim eventually forgives Jill because of the obvious double standard, combined with a less than compelling reason. You got carried away. You're trying to show off with the girls? I was the buddy of tirade. Yeah, that's right. You got it. I do it all the time on Tool Time. Now I know how you feel. So you're not going to hold this against me? No, I'm a guy. I let this stuff go. Most of Jill's problems in this series tend to come from her having issues related to Tim. While once in a while we might see Jill having fights with her sisters, Jill-centered stories frequently included Tim in some capacity, whereas Tim-centric stories, while often including Jill, with some regularity, would relegate her to a supporting player, as opposed to being a central part of the conflict. As interesting as Jill could be, she rarely steps outside the shadow of her husband. Behind the scenes, Patricia Richardson often had to fight to give her character a more rounded life throughout the series. I began to be frustrated with, I had no friend, I had no job, I had no life outside of the house, um, I never had a scene without Tim in it, um, I never had a scene alone with the children, I had never had a scene alone with Wilson, I never had any place to go. And I go, if they love me so much, then let's develop the character more and give me more to do. And they, but they love you! But then why don't you develop her? But they love you! And as one last note before we hit the final season, if you're wondering why I haven't been talking about Al much, it's because I had to cancel him after he wore blackface this season. Also, this video is really long and I needed to draw the line somewhere. I should have said, can'ts Al. Is that something? No, that's nothing. Oh no. Oh. Oh, that was my last hope. One of the biggest changes to the series in this season was the exit of Jonathan Taylor Thomas. He departed in the season's second episode titled Adios. I get to go to Costa Rica. What? Yeah, some guy dropped out of the program and they're giving me a spot. Wait, they expect you to just pick up a ghost like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be living with a family in San Ramon, which is only 20 miles from where Lauren lives. I leave on Saturday. The in-show reason for Randy's leaving was the opportunity to spend a year in Costa Rica as part of an environmental study program. At this point, Randy's has developed a very strong social conscience. Bedford's the one who's out of line. I mean, they're sweeping their pollution problem under the rug so they can maximize her profits. Quiet down, all right? Let me tell you something. 
When you get older, you'll understand not everything is so cut and dried. And I understand right now, Dad. Good. You're taking the company line. You're a sellout. You called me a sellout? Well, yeah, Dad, I called you a sellout. But then again, to be a sellout, you'd have to have principles to begin with. Although Tim and Jill don't want to see their teenage son leave, Tim in particular, they eventually acquiesce and Randy is allowed to go. Thomas would return a few episodes later for a guest appearance on the episode titled Home for the Holidays, but he would not return for the series finale. Behind the scenes, the reason for Jonathan Taylor Thomas's exit from the show was to focus on school, though some animosity was created between him and Tim Allen when Allen saw him performing in movies shortly after leaving. I wanted Jonathan on the show. I loved working with him. When I didn't get what I wanted, then I, I, I would probably say stuff that I didn't say, but didn't mean, but I did mean it. I just missed the kid, that's all. Speaking in an interview years later, Thomas said, Had I stayed at the show and tried to do academically what I'm doing now, I would have put myself in an early grave. The rest of season 8 is a mishmash of subplots that feel like the show trying to find a new footing, like Al dating a millionaire, Tim's brother Marty moving into the Taylor home with his two daughters, and we got the only two-parter in the series, Love's Labor Lost, in which Jill has an emergency hysterectomy. One thing that's particularly weird about this episode is how we learn about Jill's tumor. They're caused by a large fibroid tumor on my uterus. A tumor? I'm afraid Jill's going to need a hysterectomy. Instead of being in the room when Jill finds out, we instead learn about it with Tim. It reinforces the point I made earlier about so much of Jill's story being told through the medium of Tim. He is the star, so that's to be expected to a degree. I do wonder why that, even when it comes to having an operation, we can't let Jill be the focus of learning about her own condition. The second part does give us this nice scene between Jill and her mother, who came to Detroit to take care of Jill. You went through menopause. Did Dad still find you desirable? You yeah. betcha. <laughs> really? Well, um, what about you? I mean, did you still have the same... Same drive. Yeah. Actually, even more so. I remember one night he came home from three months on maneuvers and we went up to the bedroom and I was just a wild... That's okay, Mom. It only took the show eight seasons to give us a clear example of a mother imparting wisdom to a daughter. Previous episodes that included Jill's mother had more to do with their relationship rather than Jill's need for a positive mother figure in her life. That might just be because Jill is a grown woman, making opportunities like this rare, although we seemed to get moments like this on the regular when we had Tim going to his father figure Wilson for advice. Another interesting bit of trivia is that this season features two episodes directed by cast members, one by Patricia Richardson and one by Tim Allen. Richardson's episode, Neighbors, isn't too remarkable, but I want to talk about Allen's briefly. In Loose Lips and Freudian Slips, Jill is placed in a tough spot when she accidentally is caught making a snide comment about one of her professors. Until I had this awful conference with this horribly arrogant professor of mine. <laughs> Please don't mention his name. Please don't mention his you, name. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't. Dr. Hanover. You did. He's a pompous jackass, you know? He's smug, he's adaptive. And what is the deal with men, you know, and their comb-overs? I mean, this one was starting his neck and stretch across. Anyways. The next time she sees that professor, she is in front of him defending her thesis. On page 48, you say that feminism has complicated the traditional psychological dynamic between fathers and sons. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, I can. Um, as I stated on page 49, Fathers have to teach their sons that women and men are equal, even though they may not have been raised with that belief. Point well taken. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Comover. Hanover! <laughs> Putting aside Jill's awkwardness, that thesis should sound pretty familiar if you've been paying attention to this video. It seems Kim Flagg, the writer for this episode, has Jill writing a thesis that could substitute as a reading of the Home Improvement series itself. In fact, the premise of this episode, where Jill's true thoughts are revealed in an unguarded moment, where she makes fun of a man's comb-over, could similarly be mirroring what this episode is doing, revealing a critical reading of this show behind the guise of its usual silly antics. Wilson's lines here are especially revealing, and it raises the question how to read the subtext here. Walking Naked is a play I wrote in college. It's the saga of an Aztec warrior who finds himself in New Jersey. Ah, oh, primitive man adapts to modern society. No, 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 no. It's about a guy who loses his clothes in Newark. 
<laughs> and funny stuff happens to it. <laughs> so anyway, what does this have to do with my thesis? On... Well, my drama department wanted me to rewrite my play, but I was very passionate about walking naked. So you refused to make any of the changes? No, 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 quite the opposite. I caved in, rewrote the whole play. It was a big success. You must have been thrilled. Mm. No, I felt terrible because I compromised the integrity of the play. So you think that I should just stick to what I wrote originally? You know, Jill, your name is going to be on that thesis forever. Shouldn't it represent something that you truly believe in? Yes, it should. This episode has a lot of meta cues. It could be seen as undercutting the earlier example of the thesis reading. So maybe this whole episode is making fun of people like me, who read into things a bit too much. The show resolves the plot with Jill rejecting the committee's notes and sticking to her original thesis. In a way, the show feels like it's acknowledging that it shouldn't be more than its original premise, and maybe because of that, it needs to end. I think it's very telling that this is the episode Tim Allen directed. I think what he's expressing are his frustrations that this series is drifting away from its original stated premise, and that's the masculine response to feminism. And as it drifts away from that premise, it's costing the show's voice its authenticity. And that brings us to the final episode, a three-parter titled The Long and Winding Road. Tool Time has a new producer, Morgan, and he changes the show to be more spectacle than home repair. More spectacle than usual, anyway. Tim, frustrated with losing all his creative control of the show, decides to quit, and he's followed out the door by Alan Heidi. If you're going to turn this show into a three-ring circus, I might just quit. Sorry to lose you. You were a good man. Meanwhile, Jill is offered a job as a counselor in Indiana, leading the tailors to a familiar question. Okay, so Tim, should she take this job? Absolutely. <laughs> the job's in Seattle. Karen, this is stupid. Okay, okay, let me ask you another question. Tool time goes national, but you have to move to New York. Do you go? Yeah, it's my job. It'd be perfect... If it's okay with Jill. Oh, so you're saying that uh, your job is more important than hers? Shouldn't have a job. Answer the question, Tim. Do you move to New York or Seattle? This might be a good time for you to support Jill. The truth is, my family's always been based around me and my career. I never really thought about what would happen if, you know... You never thought you'd be making the same sacrifices for Jill as she did for you. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although Tim is initially resistant to it, there isn't much discussion about the move. She's got to move to Indiana for a job. I'm willing to put on a moo moo and curlers for her. <laughs> so does this mean you're willing to discuss it now? Don't need to. We're going. Yeah. I'm not too keen on that. Even though he's essentially siding with Jill here, this makes it look like the decision was still his, instead of there being any sort of discussion. It's a bit incongruent, an episode that's supposed to be about Tim learning to let someone else take the lead. The second part of the finale is Tim driving Brad and Mark to school, which is an excuse to show off clips from some classic episodes. Country music star Kenny Rogers recorded the song, We've Got It All, for this episode. The story picks up again in the third part and final episode of Home Improvement. Tim records the final episode of Tool Time with a bunch of guest stars. The episode gets huge ratings, and Morgan changes his mind, offering Tim big money to stay. I've been trying to convince him to stay with Tool Time. He keeps turning me down. He hated what you did to his show. No, 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 that's all changed. It's the last episode. We offered to make him the executive producer, and we offered to give him a big raise. But he won't budge. Something about Indiana. He turned you down because of my job offer? Meanwhile, Al is getting married to his girlfriend Trudy in the Taylor backyard. A classic ending for a comedy. By the power vested in me by the state of Michigan and the Church of the Celestial Moon. <laughs> I now pronounce you husband and wife. I don't know why Wilson is some kind of celestial moon priest. In spite, or maybe because of that, the wedding goes off without a hitch. But will Tim take the big money? Or are he and Jill moving to Indiana? The moving dilemma is sort of addressed in the final scene. I know you don't want to go to Indiana. It's not about me. It's about you. Are you willing to give up this opportunity? Yeah, I am. I don't want to leave my life here. No, I just... I can't imagine 
leaving this house. Well, if we ever decide to move, maybe we wouldn't have to leave the house. What does that mean? Did they move? Or is that strictly Tim's fantasy? The ending here is deliberately vague due to a disagreement between Tim Allen, Patricia Richardson, and the writers. The writers were pushing for the Taylors to move to Indiana, whereas Allen and Richardson were fighting for a less cliché ending than turning the lights out on an empty home. The ending we got was a compromise, and in many ways, that fits the show quite nicely. It had settled itself to the idea that Tim would uproot his life for his wife in the first part of the finale, and now it was confronting the idea of Jill taking charge herself. While I, as a viewer, might like to see Tim step aside, since it would symbolize Tim shedding his persona of masculine dominance, I'm not sure the show earned such a departure from the man we've been watching for eight seasons. Tim Taylor grew throughout the series, definitely, but how radical has this change been? The fact that he twisted Jill's decision into his own, shutting down the discussion on a move they would make as partners, suggests to me that he isn't ready to stop being the family patriarch just yet. He'll bend, but only slightly. The vague ending suggests that this conversation isn't over. The series finale was a massive rating success. It was the fifth highest rated series finale for the decade, and it captured 35.5% of American households that night. The decision to end the show largely came from Tim Allen, who was creatively drained after eight seasons. He reportedly turned down an offer of $50 million for a new season of Home Improvement. Patricia Richardson was also offered a huge paycheck to return, $25 million, though she took some issue with being paid half as much as Tim. So Tim and I sat down and we said, there's no way to do the show anymore the way it is. Zach's graduating, he's moving, Jonathan's gone. You know, the only way to do it is to totally change the show. We'd have to have them like, you know, move away and open up a bed and breakfast somewhere or something or have Tim go back and teach shop. I mean, that was one of the ideas we talked about. The only way this is going to happen is you, you pay me exactly the money you pay him. I, we're, co we're total equals. You pay me exactly the money you pay him. We're executive producers. I get, if you offer him $2 million an episode, you give me $2 million an episode. We're total equal and I don't do it. Richardson's complaints were joined by similar ones from other cast members. And all that arguing played a role in Tim's decision to end the show. So I sat there and, and I thought about, can I do this? again, knowing Pat's concerns were just almost impossible to, to address. I just didn't want money to be the motivator, and it would have been. <laughs> Earl Hindman, who played Wilson, if you don't recognize his face, only took a few small roles after Home Improvement ended in 1999. His lifetime of smoking seems like the likely cause of his diagnosis of lung cancer in 2003. He passed away on December 29th of the same year at the age of 61. According to castmates and staff members of the show, Hinman was well-loved on the set, and notably one of the few actors who never made a fuss about their role, even though he was permanently behind a wooden fence. This is a good place to restate. Hinman's performance as Wilson was excellent, although I didn't particularly appreciate the character's point of view at times. Hinman delivered his lines with compassion and wisdom that you could really feel throughout its delivery. The rest of the cast went on to have various levels of success, though it's safe to say that none of them were on as huge a hit as Home Improvement had been. Though reportedly very friendly backstage, the remaining cast wasn't completely reunited until 2011 in a photo shoot for Entertainment Weekly. Tim Allen went on to star in Last Man Standing, a sitcom on ABC that's more or less Home Improvement, except raising three girls instead of three boys. And instead of having a tool show, he sells sporting goods. The show also notably featured several small home improvement reunions, including appearances by Richard Karn, Patricia Richardson, and Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Its reaction from critics has been lukewarm, but unlike Home Improvement, it hasn't been nearly as successful with viewers, peaking at 40th place in the overall ratings. While Home Improvement had a theme that was fairly conservative, the political messaging in Last Man Standing is much more overt, such as having the Tim Allen character, Mike Baxter, be a Mitt Romney supporter in its second season. I haven't discussed Home Improvement's political leanings as much because they're very implicit and not as overt, but it shouldn't surprise anyone at this point that Tim Allen is a fairly conservative guy. 
so it's only natural that a show with his name on it reflects his worldview to some degree. And what we see throughout Home Improvement is a show that's, at its core, a conservative one. Conservative in the reasonable sense, not in the reactionary crypto-fascist sense. Although, it should be noted that Tim Allen has, at times, expressed his desire to use the N-word in his comedy, which, for all our sakes, thankfully has not happened. Not that I have any love for Tim Allen, more that we don't really need more using the N-word. People love to complain about shows being political, and I can get on board with complaints of messaging being clumsy or ham-fisted, but part of this look back at Home Improvement has, I hope, highlighted how politics, or more specifically the social relationships between men and women, can be seen as a central theme regardless of any political party or policy being mentioned. Politics, even how they shape our interpersonal lives, are always present. Home Improvement was not a feminist show by any stretch, but was it an anti-feminist show? At its core, I'd argue no. While it scratches its head at basic feminism concepts like a woman getting a job, it doesn't present it as something negative, more as something that is confusing, and it certainly doesn't fall into the trap of portraying feminism as something destructive. It tries, oftentimes clumsily, to debate the merits of feminism and how it applies to men. And to its credit, it does seed some ground, acknowledging that feminism can be a positive thing for men even though it backs away from using the word itself. Also a part of Home Improvement are the many implicit assumptions that keep it from reflecting a modern conception of manhood. That is to say, modern in the year 2019. As I said earlier, Home Improvement featured no gay men, very few men of color, and only vaguely refers to trans men. This creates a show that represents a very specific viewpoint, the white hetero cis male. And that should be noted as an observation, not a criticism. Watching Home Improvement now felt very much like watching an old show, and why a show like Home Improvement in the present would feel even more archaic. The idea of a Home Improvement reboot was something Tim Allen was considering in 2018 when it looked like The Last Man Standing was going to be cancelled by ABC. With many of its cast members on board and reboots being so fashionable, it would have been a sure thing had Last Man Standing not suddenly been picked up by Fox, where it was renewed for a few more seasons. It's possible that reboot might still happen one day, but as for the time being, Alan seems content with his current sitcom. Home Improvement is very much an old guard show. It's a show from the past, created in the 90s, signaling a dying breed with an archaic grunt. If it was old-fashioned then, it feels even older now. And to call it apolitical would be a mistake, because the act of advocating for the status quo, or the past, even when you're eschewing politics, still has implicit in it a political stance, and this show is clearly making a stand for the patriarchy. Acknowledging some positive points of feminism, but never completely abandoning the idea that men are the driving force within the world. This show felt to me like watching something finely crafted, with some humor and heart, but ultimately a relic. This one took way longer to produce than I expected. I'd like to give a special thank you to the YouTube channel SJW Debates. He helped me out with some of the humor theory for this video. Anyone unfamiliar with his channel should absolutely check it out. Also, of course, many thanks to my patrons whose names are floating up the screen now. Uh, if you'd like to be a, a patron and have your name on the credits and maybe something more, if I ever think up more patron rewards, you can go to my Patreon. Uh, it's linked below. I'm getting very close to releasing a bonus video where I sing, and uh, it's not going to be that great. If you would like more of me and my loveliness, you can follow me on Twitter. I also have a Curious Cat where you can fire off a few questions. And obviously, obviously, do I need to say it? Yes, I need to say it. Like comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. Thanks for watching. And I, I went the whole video without doing it, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to try doing it now. Do the grunt. Okay. Oh, 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 <laughs> that's, that's bad. Let's do the grunt for real. Oh, oh. <laughs>